this video is about cross-polarization jamming, which I will also call cross-pole jamming, as it pertains to the antenna of a particular Swedish missile called RBS-15. And I found something really interesting. The antenna is a strange design which appears to be highly susceptible to cross-pole jamming because the designers chopped up the reflector. Several years ago, I was interested in learning about the Swedish RBS-15 missile since it's advertised as uh, quite an intelligent machine. In particular, I wanted to find a photo of the Seeker antenna to explore its susceptibility to cross-pole jamming. And I found a photo of what appears to be an early version of the antenna. It's a strange design. It looks a bit like a surveillance radar. It's a paraboloidal reflector which has been truncated. The bottom half of the paraboloidal reflector is missing possibly to provide room for an IR tracker or a video camera or both, or some other sensor anyway. And I also found this antenna, evidently used by the RBS-04E. Uh, it looks like a more evolved version of the previous antenna. Notice that the uh, bus has similar features and the reflector has only a slightly different shape. But the principles are the same. The feed is at the focus and no doubt the feed's radiation pattern is tailored uh, to the top part of the paraboloid or reflector that it illuminates. By inspection, the feed is a waveguide aperture flared into a horn. It appears to me to be horizontally polarized because the aperture, the horn aperture, is taller than it is wide. But also we can see there are two waveguide channels up to the flange of the final adapter, and that says horizontal polarization to me. Also by inspection, the antenna is gimbaled in the azimuth plane only. And this part here looks like a flexible waveguide, so the antenna doesn't need a rotating waveguide joint, which is quite clever by the designers. I mean, a rotating joint could, and almost certainly would, introduce higher losses than a flex guide, and certainly it would increase the cost. And remember, a flex guide is a good enough solution. The seeker only needs to work for a few minutes. It is a disposable, single-use item. Okay, so continuing with the story about the missiles, the online information indicates that these missiles are extremely intelligent and that the designers were very focused on hardening both the seeker and the autopilot against ECM. And this link provides astonishing information about how the RBS-04E operates and many of its intelligent features, provided, provided it's not in disinformation, but, it's, but it doesn't look to me like it is. I think it's real. And I think it's fair to say that this information provides an unclassified glimpse into next-generation cognitive missiles. For example, this link here points to what they call an interactive demonstration of th that shows the flexibility of this weapon. I mean, the, look, look, at, look at what it's doing. Look at what they say it can do. Uh, and don't miss the multiple synchronized attacks at the end. Now, because also, another thing that makes this weapon dangerous is that both the RBS-15 and the RBS-04E both use a turbojet engine instead of a rocket motor, so these things can loiter. If the missile gets fooled by a countermeasure, it can turn around and come back for another try. It can get a fix on the target, switch off the, the Seeker RF and revert to inertial navigation, then fly cross-range to a new uh, bearing from the ship, that's called a dogleg maneuver, and then turn the Seeker back on for the final attack from a different bearing. And, as I said in an earlier video, it is absolutely essential that the Seeker antenna be moved off the target in order to cause a missile miss. Now, this is very hard to do in practice. The present-day main options are to throw something overboard, like a chaff cloud or a decoy or a drone. I mean, the downside of that, those options, obviously, is that eventually you run out of things to throw overboard, and the ship has to either leave, or somebody has to put themselves in harm's way to bring more goodies. But there are other options. There is another option, but it's not discussed very much because it's not well understood. Active onboard angle deception jamming. The onboard jammer creates a phantom ship seen only by the missile seeker. Now there is a small toolbox of options here, but it's real. And one of them is cross-polarization jamming, about which I've made several videos. The bottom line is that cross-pull can be used to exploit a vulnerability that has either been overlooked by the missile designers or they just couldn't get rid of it without throwing away targets. And I would say that this vulnerability is baked into the seeker antenna design, monopulse or otherwise, but that the explanation of that is out of scope for this video. It's inappropriate in the open anyway, so that's not going to happen. 
So treating, anyway, treating the RBS-04E or RBS-15 as future missile test cases, here's the question. Given the antenna's unusual shape, what is its cross-polar gain? A high, remember, a high cross-polar gain is a gateway to cross-polarization jamming effectiveness. It's a necessary but not sufficient condition for cross-pole jamming effectiveness. In a previous video, I explained that the cross-polar gain pattern of a reflector antenna is due to the polarization of the feed as seen by the reflector. And I will re-explain that here for convenience, but the reflector is just a, an example case. Uh, for the detailed story, go to the video. So to re-explain, the polarization of the feed is the same as an infinitesimal dipole in the far field. So it looks like this. The E-field vectors tip outward at the bottom and inward at the top. This is because the RF power flow is the cross product of the electric and magnetic fields, and since power flow is always radial in the far field, E and H must both be tangent to a sphere. Now the E field impressed on the reflector looks like this. For a horizontally polarized feed, the fields in each quadrant of the reflector has a small vertical component that changes sign from quadrant to quadrant. And remember that the feed is horizontally polarized. The feed is horizontally polarized. And if it's a waveguide, then the vertical components that are on the reflector, they will not propagate through the guide. The guide is in cutoff for vertical polarization full stop. But suppose this picture here represents the electric field impressed on the reflector by a copolar beacon, not a jammer yet, but just a copolar beacon, as seen by the feed. That's what the seed feed sees on the reflector when it, the, the electric reflector is illuminated by a copolar beacon. Now, if we rotate the polarization of the beacon from copole, which is horizontal, to crosspole, which is vertical, those little vertical components, the components that were formerly vertical, now become horizontal components, and they will propagate in the feed. Now, remember from radiation, the radiation pattern of an antenna is the Fourier transform of the electric field over its aperture. And since the vertical E-fields components change sign from quadrant to quadrant, the resulting radiation pattern will have four lobes, one in each quadrant. And these are called Condon lobes, and they lie on the diagonals of the antenna pattern, which makes sense from the E-field pattern, so flipping sign each quadrant. Now, the opposite sign symmetry of the E-field on the reflector is why the antenna gain is negligible in the vertical and horizontal planes, in the principal planes. Along these two lines, the E-field contributions from all four lobes cancel with each other. Cancel, they cancel each other. But that doesn't tremendously matter when it comes to a cross-pole jammer, uh, cross-pole jamming. Uh, the seeker designers make the seeker receiver exquisitely sensitive to RF signals with a huge dynamic range so it can maintain range lock on the target when it finds one. Uh, the receiver dynamic range is a lot bigger than the variation of the dynamic range of the antenna pattern, even accounting for a low cross-polar gain in the principal planes. It's a lot, but it's not more than the dynamic range of the, of the seeker, of the receiver. And this is why an azimuth-only tracker is still susceptible to cross-pole jamming, even though its angular movement is confined to this deep low-gain channel in the azimuth plane. Low-gain channel to cross-polar radiation pattern of the seeker antenna. So here's, an, here's the important part. The RBS-04E and the RBS-15 antennas both have chopped off the bottom part of the reflector, and the RBS-04E has chopped off a bit of the top, too, it looks like. Clipping the bottom or top off the reflector destroys its vertical symmetry. When the reflector is symmetrical, the cross-polar E-fields that are anti-phased top to bottom cause a null in the cross-pole radiation pattern across the azimuth plane at zero elevation. Clipping off the bottom or top of the reflector means those fields don't cancel anymore because they're not there. Now, from the point of view of susceptibility to cross-pole jamming, this is just the worst possible scenario for an azimuth-only seeker. The four cross-polar condon lobes that were safely tucked away in each quadrant, never to be seen directly by the antenna because it only moves in the azimuth plane at nearly zero elevation. Those eye-gain parts of the radiation pattern have now been moved down exactly into the plane where the seeker tracks, where the targets are, on the sea horizon. So I predict that this particular antenna design will have a high cross-polar gain and that the peak gain will be near the azimuth track plane, right where, right where the seeker operates. So I did a quick and dirty modification of the engaged reflector antenna model to represent what I call the truncated reflector. So here's what clipping off the bottom of the reflector does to the cross-polar sum patterns. 
here's the pattern for the full reflector, and here's the pattern with 40% of the bottom removed. And we can see we went from four lobes to two lobes as expected. Now here's what happens to the peak cross polar gain in the azimuth plane as I vary the fraction of the reflector that's been removed. As expected, the highest cross polar gain occurs when half the dish is gone. Removing more lowers the gain, cross polar gain, and removing less also lowers the peak cross polar gain. What this means is that the jammer has finer control of the seeker antenna pointing direction, allowing, for example, slow separation of a false target from the ship, or better control of the missile to fly it left or right, but uh, flight control of the missile by a cross pole jammer is out of scope for this video. Anyway, the relatively high cross-polar gain in the azimuth plane is visible in this video sequence here, uh, which shows the seeker's sum power pattern in response to triangular swept cross-pole jamming. The left side graphic represents the full reflector seeker antenna, and the right side graphic is the same reflector with 40% removed, so nearly all of the bottom half of the reflector is gone. And by inspection, this case has relatively high cross-polar gain in the azimuth plane throughout the entire polarization modulation cycle. Now, there's a whole lot more to say about these two missiles, but this concludes a look at what has turned out to be a very interesting antenna uh, from the perspective of cross-pole jamming.